welcome to the Swift Half, your weekly session of chat from the UK OCR and adventure running scene. Each week, pub landlord Alan and our favourite regular Ian discuss races, runners and anything else that comes to mind. So pull up a pew, pour yourself a drink and join us for the Swift Half. You're listening to the 101st most popular podcast, as listened to by 10 people, both of whom understand binary. Hey, my friend, welcome back to the Swift Dark. How are you? I'm good, Alan. Can you believe it's been a week and we're now on the 7th of December? Ian, I can't believe we're on the 7th of December because it's not the Sorry. 7th, it's the 8th. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did that deliberately for our patrons. <laughs> oh, yeah, because our patrons get it on the 7th. Oh, Ian, you're getting, you're getting ahead of yourself. You're even getting ahead of me now. There we go. Last week, we, we had one Patreon reach out to say we mess with their mind. So it is either the 7th or the 8th as you're listening to this, or you might be listening to it on the 21st of December, 2042, when OCR is but a distant memory. <laughs> oh, good would that be if someone actually did listen to 20? I'll probably not be here in 2042, but you'll be here. Can you imagine if they message you, Ian, I've just listened to your podcast from 20, 2023. If anyone's listening in 2042, reach out, we'll, we'll, we'll meet up. By that time, I think I'll have a free bus pass, so I'll be able to get to you. Might take a while, but I will get to you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, God, free bus pass. Um, guess what I've just been doing? What have you just been doing? I've been speaking to a real-life mermaid. A real life mermaid. Yeah, but she does. She swims in with sharks and things like that. And when she gets out of the water, a, a, a tail thing turns to actual legs, so she can run tough with us. Oh, and have has B sent you more beer? <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't actually, but you know what we're talking about. So I'm actually drinking tea again. I run out of beer. Anyone wants to send me beer? I'm, I'm on tea. <laughs> Only joking, boys and girls. I'm on tea for a reason. Um, okay, so you're not on beer. What? Ah, you you just got a new house. Have you been painting? Have you been going too close to them fumes? <laughs> you know, actually, that could be the reason. But no, seriously, I have just been spoken speaking to Miss Oceana 2023, Laura Hudson. She's coming on our podcast. She's a real-life mermaid. We're not going to spoil this for anybody, but she's a real-life mermaid by day or night. She, she's a real-life mermaid by day or night. Okay. Yeah. I can work with that, I think. Got to two weeks and you've got to listen to it then. You're going to love it. You're going to love this one especially. In fact, I might send it to you early into the Patreons because this is going to be an amazing one, this one. I still can't believe you've not made me join the Patreon for, for all of this. <laughs> I reckon that's coming eventually. It, yeah, you, you, you're giving me little teasers. You'll probably send me half re- the episode like we did to our listeners a few uh, weeks ago, and then I'll have to join Patreon to get the rest of it. We've done that a few times recently. We've got to be really careful. I've got to be really careful now about when I when I click send or edit and that. Um, for some reason, Libsyn's been playing up, but we're, we're all right now. We're all right now. We are. And you said what you're drinking. Should I say what I'm drinking? What, what, what are you drinking? Are you on a Tesco meal deal again to, this week? No, actually, this was a Subway meal deal. <laughs> Go on. Well, well, first oh. of all, the Subway meal deal, what did you have with the sub? What did you have? Six inch, 12 inch meatballs? I think I, I think I had a wrap. I actually got this meal deal last Friday and never drunk the drink. Um, I got it last Friday because near our gym there's a Subway and I did a horrible training session. I had tea here. And you know when you just can't be bothered cooking and there was a subway and Greg's wasn't open? <laughs> yeah, that's a valid point. That's a valid point. Subway's so, good. as part of my Subway meal deal, I got a Gatorade. Oh, I hadn't seen that for years. Wasn't that um, in American football? Didn't they have on the sidelines all the time for years, Gatorade? They did. It's actually named after the Florida Gators. Okay, so... Is that like, I'm going to guess there's an American football team then? They are. They Well, they're a university team, so technically the Gators covers their baseball team, their basketball team, but they're most well-known 
for their American football, the Florida Gators. And you'll often see, if you see a baseball cap with a gator on, often it would be Florida Gators. It's it's quite famous. But, yeah, it was developed back there, and it literally is gator aid. Ah, because it aids the gators to perform better. Exactly, exactly. Clever when you think about it. Play on words. I like it. I like that. The flavour is cool blue. And you know what? I always am a bit dubious when it doesn't actually say a flavour, it says a colour. And honestly, I can't tell you what it tastes like. It just tastes sweet. Like cool blue. Tastes like cool blue. (laughs) Like cool blue, evidently. I think it was either cool blue or roadie red. So I went for cool blue. I always think blue drinks always taste of bubble gum. You know what? Yeah, it does have that kind of bubble gum taste. And when you think about it, a blue drink, it's an unnatural colour. There's not much in the nature that's actually blue other than the sky. Yeah, I can't think of any. Ice is sometimes blue. You get blue ice, but it's not to drink, is it? That's It melts. No, I, it's I, not blue when it melts, is it? No, I, I'd, I'd say it's more transparent and it's just what's inside makes it blue maybe but then again someone's going to tell me now that the sky's not blue and it's actually a reflection of the ocean or something like that this is something that martin gemmel would know martin let us know i like that it's the reflection of the ocean <laughs> a cloud just yeah. like sheep just floating in the sky then no uh, clouds are candy floss but uh but the baby jesus has dropped and yeah he goes into the atmosphere do you, do you believe the world's flat as well, or is it round? I do not believe the world's flat. However, if you read what they have as their proof, it's hard to disprove it. I, it is, isn't it? I, I don't have, I've actually looked and I thought, yeah, it is hard to disprove that it's not really flat. Should we give the, the listener a, a quick uh, preview? This will only take probably 30 seconds. But basically, listener, they believe that the centre of this flat Earth is actually the North Pole. And the South Pole doesn't exist as a landmass. It is literally just a icy border that is on all sides of the of the globe. So it's not how you imagine a map looking flat. It is literally this idea that the North Pole is the centre and you've got the ice wall. And one of the reasons they say yeah they can prove it is because no one has ever flown from say australia to south america by going over the south pole like they do for like from manchester to dallas texas we fly over the north pole well not the whole north pole but you kind of just edge it and it's hard to disprove that until someone flies over the south pole will it will never get disproved even though people have walked to the centre of the South Pole, or so-called walked to the centre of the South Pole, has anyone ever walked across it? I don't think they have out there. I don't think they have. But of course, it falls down when you think, why would you fly over the South Pole? Because there's so much ocean. It's not like the North Pole, which is like surrounded by various other islands like uh, of land masses. So Canada is not really that far from the North Pole in the grand scheme of things. Whereas... The Antarctica is, yeah, it's oceans for miles and miles and miles. It makes no logical sense to fly over it. No, no. But if someone went round it, they're not actually going round it, other than actually going inside it. Oh, uh, yeah, it just it baffles me anyway. And let's move on because I'm just baffled with all of that science that things will baff, baffle me no end, which is exactly what Kevin Newey's post went out this week with the Obstacle Racing magazine, it baffled me because I thought it would come back. I thought Obstacle Racing magazine had come back until I opened it up and I looked at it and I got really nostalgic. You did. It's almost 10 years old. It was the January 2014 edition. And just seeing all them races back then was phenomenal. And there was there's some races weren't even on there, like um, like Ram Run, which I think started a few years later. Um, Dash of the Titan was just a, a year after that. You know, it's some of the some of the races that were to come and some that are still going now um, that weren't there then are oh, amazing. Not, it really brought back so many memories. I've done nearly all of them races. What did surprise me is I hadn't realised that Nuclear Wild Forest has been going that long. Yeah, yeah. Nuclear Wild Forest was... Um, in the days of 
Michael Cohen, he took it on and it was a very small, very small gym um, that he rented from nuclear racers. And he did a lot of getting to, you exercised in nature. So the obstacles he built down there was very much natural things. And he, he encouraged you to run around in bare feet and um, build campfires. Yeah, we don't talk about people who run around in bare feet on the show. Sorry. <laughs> Not going to happen, but you are right. Some of the other races which are on the, you know, some people will remember like Airfield Anarchy that will live in lots of people's minds. But there are other ones that are like Viking, Viking Race, which was funny because I did Viking Race, but then my good friend uh, Ian Rawlingson, I sent him the same link. And he said, oh, no, the Viking Race we did was a different Viking Race to that Viking Race. <laughs> there, there was a lot that had very similar names back then. I mean, I remember Mud, Sweat and Beers was one of my one of my first ones. I had, in fact, the first ever race I did was in there, which was Endura, which was in Sheffield. That was my first ever taste of OCR, um, and was an amazing race. And then I went to Mud, Sweat and Beers, and I did. I think my second race was Tough Guy. Then I found Mud, Sweat and Beers, and so forth. And I, I went and did loads in 20, 2013. 2014, I, I think I did a race every weekend without fail. And you know what, Alan? It gave me an idea. You know this often happens where I have an idea. I then don't discuss it with you. We put it on the podcast and we end up having to do it. Yeah, so I don't want to know what it is. Don't tell me, <laughs> don't tell me the idea. No, go on, tell me the idea. You, you can censor, but we've just launched the new website. Um, yeah. Lots of content is going on there. Thank you, everyone, for all the content you put on. How good would it be if people from the community would write a similar article to what was in Obstacle Race magazine back then, you know, just telling people about the race and where it is and what what you do, about all the existing races. Like, if a listener will just pick one, get in touch, let us know so we don't duplicate, and then we could almost have like a database on the UK OCR website of the current races. That is actually a quality idea, Ian. So a bit like a race review, but um, but not a race review, just one about every race, which it's run by, what it involves, things like, like a bit of a synopsis of the race. Yeah, like a race directory, basically. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Because as, um, as websites have been running, do you know how many it's had websites had in the, in the first four days, Ian? Of its how many? Launch? 1,180. Wow, that's like 1,000 more than the listens we get to uh, this podcast since the start. I, thought was, I actually, I read it as 180, and I realised there was another one, and that's where I remember it when I saw it, because I was thinking 180. Um, but yeah, I was actually quite amazed when I when I saw that. Um, in the Any staff, particular the page getting it, or have you not deep-dived? No, I haven't, I haven't really deep-dived. It just... I've not gone that far. We, we're putting content. Out. It's more about getting the website ready. It's still in its early stages. So, you know, we've got a few articles on there. Thank you to people who are putting them on. I think I put one on today. New ones have gone on today about um, nuclear races, a 24-hour event that they were going to launch back in 2020. Oh, I think I read that. And I read about the author. And I can't believe this is real. In the author's bio listener... It lists the accomplishments, including Wolf Run winner. Yes, it does again. <laughs> I knew you. I only put it in for you, Ian. Just for you, I put that in. And our podcast listeners, because not everyone will get that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I just, I wasn't sure whether you were serious or not. But so, should we go with that idea? We could do it for fitness racing as well. So, any fitness races, if people want to ride, what do you reckon? 250 to 500 words? It doesn't have to be terribly long. No. Just enough um, so that people get a general... You could go up to maybe a 1,000 words, but if, you know, more than that, it'll probably get too long for people to read. So somewhere between 250 and 1,000. And as always, with anything you've put on the website, you are free to bob in your blurb. Anything you want to promote we will happily uh, do that. But yeah, if, if people want to get in touch, and it'll be cool to have a race directory. I like it. I like it. If anyone wants to do it, don't forget to send me a photo and a little 
bit about you where you put your blurb in because that's where the authors part go. So just look at mine on Nuclear 24 Hour and just put whatever you want in there. Well, Alan, looking, getting back to um, Kevin Newey, um, the thing he posted, it reminded me of something. Have you got anything else to say about it? Because it reminded no. me of something. No, go on. It reminded me that back then, Spartan was a franchise. Wasn't it? It was, it um, was indeed. Who oh, owned oh, it back then? So what? Wasn't it? There was that guy. Who was that Walter Mitty back in 2012? I want. I can't remember his name. He said he was in the forces, but he wasn't. Um, and then Pete. Oh uh, gosh, Smith Warriors down in Hastings. Um, Op Op Warriors was it? Some something like that. And if you remember when Spartan took it over, the franchise kind of became the Bear Grylls race, although not quite the Bear Grylls race in that they sold all the obstacles and that. That's it, yes. They sold all the obstacles to the people who own Bear Grylls. I wonder where all them obstacles are now. I don't know. I do wonder about obstacles and, and that. But franchises of Spartan still happen, and there was news this week about the Spartan franchise in Arabia. <laughs> or Saudi Arabia. I know where you're going with this now. Oh, Ian. Oh, this was shocking. This was shocking. Big thank you to Graham for fetching it to us. Yeah, so you remember a few weeks ago, I think it's when we had Mike Nolan on the show, so maybe two or three weeks ago, Joe did something you should never, ever, ever do if you own a company. You don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, and somehow Joe managed to talk about both of them in one incident and scorched the earth, shall we, shall we say. He upset some people whether or not those people have a right to be upset it is well my view is it's up to them to decide it's not for yeah. us to to judge their views we've already said what our view is on this podcast we want as few people to die in the current tragedies that are happening in the middle east and in ukraine as few people dying as possible please and let's get it sorted one way or another however that happens yeah. We can't solve it. Anyway, Joe upset them so much that the Saudi Arabia Spartan race has, well, uh, cancelled and said they're no longer a franchise and they're not going to do Spartans anymore. So we, we know they're cancelling the Spartans. Do we think they're going to start their own race series? Because nothing been announced yet, has there? So they've got all these venues booked. You know, I'm going to say they've been taking ticket sales, you know, they pulled out of the franchise. What do we What do we think? Because we haven't seen nothing yet. We're aware that the one that was going to happen, I believe, in February, they're going to refund. I think it's too quick a turnaround in terms of you know getting things sorted and getting ready to go. Because you won't be able to get T-shirts printed or medals sorted by then and rebranding. So firstly, well done to them for instantly saying you're going to get a refund. I, I yeah. think that's a really classy move by the owners of the Saudi um, Spartan franchise. After that, I have no idea. I don't know if you've got Bear Grylls' number. <laughs> Bear Grylls goes to Saudi. Uh, how is this going to affect some of the things that they've got planned for next year, though? Because wasn't the World Championship going to be out in Abu Dhabi and that area? It is, but that's also thinking the island border giving up its franchise would impact the United Kingdom. It, it's a separate country, and as far as I'm aware, um, the UAE Spartan is actually run by Spartan itself. Right, okay. So it would depend. That's not to say that the people that they partner with are not upset at Joe and may do something we don't know. But bear in mind, Alan, the world champs in Abu Dhabi Dabby, they have this weekend. I know, I know. So we, we know that's going to go ahead, you know. Yeah. Uh, based on chatter in the Discord from people who are close to the scene, that will be going ahead. No issues. Yeah. Um, but it's just what's going to happen next year. Watch this space, I guess. Watch yeah. this space. Because the, the other thing, Alan, is you've also got um, Tough Mudder um, Saudi Arabia which is about to have this massive infinity race. Yeah. Although they are different people to these people. So who who knows? But it once again proves that if you don't know something about, well, if you don't know everything about something, just shh, 
Yeah, particularly when it's the other side of the world and doesn't involve you in any way, shape or form. Just shh. Yeah. Just stay out of politics in is what I say. <laughs> That's why you don't vote. That's why I don't vote. <laughs> I, you see, it's, isn't it weird being people? I think people know I'm a civil servant. So I've got no qualms about that. Um, but isn't it weird that my boss is the government and I actually get a right to vote whether I want to, them to be my boss or not? Yeah, that is weird that you get to... Well, I guess technically I could become a shareholder of my place and vote, but it's not quite the the same. Although I, I discovered a long time ago, Alan, it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. Yeah, the government always wins. The government always wins. <laughs> Although, Alan, I've got to ask, uh, this is politics adjacent. We said we weren't going to talk about it, but we're, we're here now and we're, we'll go back to OCR in a minute. Have you got a advent calendar? I have got an advent calendar. Yes, I have got um, a Cadbury's um, chocolate advent calendar. Oh, I am so jealous of you because I got gifted a Bolton Council advent calendar. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you what's inside, but I'm dreading to ask it. What's inside your Bolton Council advent calendar? I don't know yet. All the windows are boarded up. <laughs> Oh, I knew something was coming. <laughs> oh, God. We could have practised that much better, I think. But we, we didn't practise it, but we could have practised it. <laughs> we never practised anything. We never practised anything. Uh, listeners, I am, of course, kidding. Bolton Council don't give free gifts, so. <laughs> no, we don't. I was expecting to turn around yeah. and say there was something weird inside it, but I wasn't expecting the windows to be boarded up. Should we move on to OCR again? <laughs> Let's go back to a little bit of OCR. Um, James at British Hub Sports reached out to us today, I believe. I've got a message about the 100 metres national trials that are oh, going to take place in January. Just to confirm, this 100 metres OCR, this is not you're going to compete against the 100 metres sprinters. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it says, Ian. So it says the British Obstacle Sports 100 Meter National Trials on 13th of January 2024. Um, British Obstacle Sports will host the British Obstacle Sports 100 Meter National Trials at Ninja Warrior UK Adventure Park, Gloucester. So the trials will provide an opportunity to be selected for the British national teams at OCR European Champs in Italy and FISO OCR World Championships in Costa Rica. However, you can take part regardless of whether you are aiming to compete at international level or not. Um, it doesn't actually say what the obstacles are from what I can see. Um, interesting one. It's open to anyone from 10 years and up, though. I like that, Ian. From 10 years and up, so we can lose to an even wider pool. <laughs> so, yeah, so we can lose to an even wider pool. Of water. Um, yeah, it, it just turns around and says, athletes will get two opportunities to run the course with the fastest time counting towards their finishing position. Doesn't really give a great more deal about what the obstacles are and things like that. I guess that's going to come in time, but it doesn't look like it's going to be the pentathlon GB course that we've talked about in the past. Well, I'd hope not, because it's only 60 metres in pentathlon. That'd be a bit mean, just uh, telling people to run for 40 metres and then here's your obstacles. Is it only 60 metres, that pentathlon GB one? I think so. It might be 80. I'm as you can see, I'm paying a lot of attention to pentathlon, as um, listeners of the show will uh, attest to. Uh, there was meant to be a champs, I believe, at one point, Alan. Yeah, there was going to be the 100 meter champs, um, and they, I think, they took this was going to be at Bath, Bath University, on their 100 meter indoor track, which is where the pentathlon GB thing is. Um, from my understanding, I think the costs were quite high. Um, to hire everything, you know, we're talking about a university. They're not going to give it away cheap, are they? Um, so it's quite high, and they they've turned around. And anyone who who entered, they've let them all know that it's it wasn't happening. It's going to happen um, in Gloucester instead at the Ninja Warrior course. So um, there was no money to refund because they only took pre pre registrations. They didn't actually take money from anyone. Yeah, it is hard hitting that critical mass, isn't it? Because Yes, a field is quite expensive to rent out, but it's nothing compared to an indoor facility. Yeah. I mean, that was what I, I remember talking to Urban Attack when they did the BMX track in Manchester. And they had the BMX track out for a day, and it was nearly £5,000 to wire that track out for the day. 
So they've got to before they even start looking at anything, it's five thousand pounds in fees. That was so much fun. I remember that as a spectator sport. That was one of the best OCR experiences I've had going to to that. If it's still on YouTube, Alan, can we share it? If we can find it, because I'm sure it was on YouTube at one point. It might have been an old muscle thing, but I'll have a look. It, it was a, it was absolutely amazing. I I competed in, but there was two of them there. I did both of them, and both of them was absolutely amazing. It was not massive obstacles, no. Back then, monkey bars were the, the toughest one, and but everyone did it. It was amazing to see. I remember um, a guy who did it, and he like. In fact, it was Chris Lamb. Chris Lamb looks like, you know, the mounds, the bumps that go up and down. Chris Lamb looked like he was in a BMX and just floated across the top of him. It was like phenomenal. I was going up and down and like this, you know, and I know our listeners can't see my hands waving up and down. And Chris Lamb just floated across him as though it was like, well, it, it was amazing. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was good. And they had some great um, MCs there as well. It was the guys from Airfield Anarchy. So as M- they emceed it, which was good. Um, so, yeah, it, it, amazing event. Yeah, I watched the second one, and I do remember we had a couple of friends there, and it was interesting because they were almost like rock stars, if, if that makes sense. Uh, even though it was only, I don't know, 300, 400 people there at the second event. It might have even been less, but it felt like in the stands there was at least 200. And... It was just such a great, and it'd be great if this 100 metre takes off to the extent that they can do something like that. Oh, definitely. Um, I'd, I'd love to see something like that where we could we could watch it. And the good thing about it, when it was on the track, it, I think it was about 400 metres long. But because it was on a BMX track, it was like going 50 metres up, 50 metres back. And you could see it all quite easily, um, as opposed to like doing a, the full loop of like a, a running track, for instance. Um, so yeah, I quite yeah. enjoyed it. People can probably picture it in their mind. We will share it, but it's similar to like a high rocks or a decker is no, everything is pretty much there. And if you are at a height, you can see everything going on, and it's just great to great to watch. But you mentioned that the hundred meters is at a ninja park, and apology corner two weekends ago, the ninja sport UK held their first ever award show and well done to them it sounds like it was an amazing event well done to Shadir who we're aware was organizing a lot of it behind the scenes I know he's going to say be modest and say it was a team effort and it probably was but we know how hard he worked definitely definitely um and it was it was asking us questions and we was all we was trying to help out as best we can um but it was all it was all them and well done to him have you got some results for me I do. I have the winner's list. So the Ninja Training Facility of the Year was True Function Ninja Training Ground. The fan favourite Ninja Park was Ninja Warrior UK Gloucester. Is that the one that's hosting this? I believe it is, yeah. Yeah. It did say Ninja Warrior, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ninja Warrior UK Adventure Park Gloucester. So not only is it the 100 metre trial day you get to go in the fan favorite ninja park why wouldn't you want to go sounds amazing then we have service to ninja sport that went to dion trigg we then had ninja personality of the year and former podcast guest i believe that was his personal highlight of his life so far uh <laughs> ali hay yes <laughs> we had youth ninja personality of the year charisma Batkisfield. You know what? I love the fact that they're doing it as personality like we do. Yes. Yes. I like that. Because I listeners may or may not realize this, but when it comes to the awards, the personality of the year, it's not just the person who is best on the on the course, on the field, on the OCR. That's what we have the the series for to determine who the best athletes are. A- exactly. The personality is part of that, but he's also been a good ambassador for the sport. You know, going out there, I think last year, in terms of um, actual OCR prowess, uh, I believe Lindsay's probably middle of the pack, but she does so much for the sport, and that's why she was the deserved winner. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, we then had International Ninja of the Year, which it made me chuckle for some reason. Reading International Ninja of the Year just made me chuckle. 
Because I imagined, you know, Ryu or Ken from uh, Street Fighter winning this. But no, it <laughs> it was an actual award and it went to a Victor Mikhailov. See, I said it right. Um, the best Ninja Sport UK league competition venue was HC Fit in Liverpool. I've been there. It's a great place. We then had one, and we might steal this award one time, Alan. Youth Ninja Influencer of the Year. Well, this is like, obviously, a ninja that does the videos and that on YouTube and Instagram and things like that. Yeah, I I think that's actually quite a good award when you think about it. Because, again, it kind of goes into that whole getting people behind the sport, but it would probably reward someone who might not be a big enough name to win the personality. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Do you think um, with Will's youthful looks that he could qualify for it if we did it in OCR? Well, I think that Masters should be 65 plus. So, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> At least for a year, anyway. Yeah. Who won? It was won by Billy Dixon. So, well done to Billy Dixon. The most improved ninja of the year was Victor Mikhailov again. And the most improved youth ninja was Charisma Backisfield again. So well done to Charisma for getting the double when it came to Youth Ninjas, but also you had Billy Dixon though. She didn't quite get the triple crown. No. But that was, that well, was... well done to all those winners. And yeah, well done to the Ninja Sport UK team for putting on a great event. Talking about awards, hours are up and running. Nominations are coming in thick and fast. I think we've had about 60, 70 people, I think, already responded. Get them in. If you haven't got yours in, your nominations in, get them in fast because um, it closes on the 12th. So on the 12th of this month, nominations close. And then we will start, I think, just over a week later, we open it up for voting, providing our panel get them get them shortlisted. Yeah, so just checking, is that Tuesday the 12th? Tuesday the 12th. Any reason why we picked a random Tuesday? No, I just gave him 10 days to to get the vote in, <laughs> to get the nominations in. We're always like that. We Yeah, there's never any rhyme or reason, is there? No, yeah. 10 days sound a good again. Oh, gosh. Anyway, what else have we got on the notes? Um, oh, Raw Fit 12 Runs of Christmas. I'm getting very, very, um, what's the word? FOMO, because I can't run at this moment in time. I'm still recovering from the injury. I've missed out on the first time of Raw Fit's 12 Runs of Christmas. Um, it's looking funny, and I'm I'm gutted I'm missing it because they're all getting dressed up in Christmassy stuff and running every day. So we're getting dressed up in fancy dress. Yeah, and I'm missing and it. Running. Yeah, it's oh. not good. I'm not happy. He's can you still join? No, because it's like twelve. One day, day eight, day seven, day eight. I can't remember what date is. What date did you say was seventh? Weren't it seventh for patrons and day eight for normal people? Um, so only four days left. Oh, that, that's a shame. But could you not do it the 12 days as in the actual 12 days? I think we've discussed this, haven't we? That the first day of Christmas is actually the 25th. So what we're saying is that Rick should open it up again for the actual 12 days of Christmas, and then I should be able to do it. Because I'm starting again next week. Exactly. Rick, if you're hearing this and you've still got medals available, let's double up. Let's double up. I like it. 24 days of Christmas. <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, so that was a that's a run that's ongoing. Yeah. A run shuttered shop this uh, week, didn't it? The the deer stalker, I believe you're gonna talk about. Yes, we are. Which is the Scottish trail run with a little bit of OCR in that got cancelled in March because of the snow, so they held it in November when there's snow. But they didn't cancel it this time. They didn't cancel it. So it's the last ever deer stalker. We talked about it last week. And should we say reports were mixed? Some reports are very mixed, actually. I've got to admit that it's like... I've heard some people have put on um, Sorry to See uh, Best Event to Date, things like that. And then I've, I've read other reports where they were saying that the obstacles weren't there, you know. Because have you ever done deer stalker, Ian? I have, and I don't remember obstacles. When you went up to the woods, there were some like little miniature obstacles, some balance beams and a couple of little crawls and things like that. Do you not remember them? I don't. Was that after the, oh, what, what do we call it? Um, 
is it the skag or something or the scrag or what, what's it called? The screen, scree, yeah, the, the screen. No, it's no, it before the screen, scree, before the screen. Right, yeah, I don't remember them, but maybe I put out any memory before the screen. In fact, after the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that actually makes sense. Um, no, it was it was before. There, was, there weren't very many of big, but there was some. You always ran over a couple of a bales to start with. I always remember that. Um, and then you went through a bit of a muddy section, and then you went up through the woods. As you went up through the woods, there was like some. There were very much rat race, rat racy, dirty weekend obstacles that you saw in the woods over there. So there were nothing major. There were balance beams and little things you went under and over and that. Um, or oh, there was the two times I did it. Um, and the report I've said that they weren't there, they'd all they had all gone. Um the the river crossing wasn't or the river run wasn't as long as what it normally is. I don't know why. Maybe that was for health and safety. I don't know why. But then I've also heard that the the event village wasn't as good as what it was either. But then I've got other reports are telling me it was amazing. Yeah, it's hard and I actually didn't check. I, I reached out to a few people who were volunteering and I didn't check whether I could read it out. So I'm not going to read out what they've said, but a couple of things that they mentioned was how initially the party was meant to be held in a local indoor hall, but uh, in the end it wasn't. It was just held in the registration tent, which... Uh, it's probably not as much fun as when I went to it. It was still in a tent, but it was in a beer tent. Yeah, massive, massive beer tent. Not like, like a marquee type of thing. Yeah, marquee. So it sounds like they doubled up on on that. It doesn't sound like the slide was there. Uh, it also sounds that some of the people doing the double deer stalker took a wrong turn or got pointed the wrong way, and a few of them all un, um, finished up their first lap in eight minutes. So oh, wow. well done to them. <laughs> <laughs> Super time! <laughs> yeah, no, um, we, we, yeah. Uh, apparently, that was a Marshall messing up, but it it is what it what it is. I I guess it. The overwhelming thing I hear is that if there was a cost, Rat Race have found a way to make it a bit cheaper. Yeah, that is uh, that is sort of what I've heard. That it, it sort of felt a little bit cheap, and I've got to admit, I mean, I've signed up for the the um, Sea to Summit series. Um, with the exception, I'm not going to go back to Snowdonia. I can go and run Snowdonia whenever I want. So I've signed up for Ben Nevis, and I've signed up for Scaffold Pike. When I did the last Man V Mountain, I've never done Man V Mountain before, so it was my first Man V Mountain. I thought I'm going to do it because it's the last ever one. And I've got to admit, I was a little bit disheartened with it, I, w- I want to say. So, nice course. You went up um, up Snowden. A little bit gutted that at the top, there was that many people up there. I'd never been up Snowden before, so I was gutted that there was that many people at the top and you couldn't actually get to the top. Um, but then I heard that the water jump, so the jump into the water, you were jumping from about five metres. Well, I think it was more like three metres, so it wasn't really that that good um the slide into the water was very tiny it just felt a little bit the cut corners as i want to say and then when you got the medal and you got the wooden medal it wasn't really what i was expecting although i do like wooden medals when you're paying over 100 and something pound for it i i want something a little bit better if i'm honest yeah it does seem like you say they, they did seem to cut corners and okay hand on heart for various reasons, me and Rat Race have never really got on. Not personally. I, I don't know him from, from Adam. And, uh, yeah, I, I won't say a bad thing about anyone who tries to make their uh, their fortune in this crazy world that we inhibit. If it wasn't for them people, we would just be talking about clouds, wouldn't we, Alan? Yeah, we would, yeah. yeah. But every time I've done a Rat Race, there's always been something. Yeah, it, it's like the little things, like everything's an add-on. Yeah, like parking's extra, breathing's extra. If you want a, a biffy bag, it, it's extra. Or yeah, it always feels like, and it's not, it's not a minor extra either. It's like parking's ridiculously priced. No, I, 
you said that, and I actually think about that now, and I think the events are very much like, here's an event, but to compete in this event, you've got to have a bivy bag. And if you haven't got one, we'll sell you one for a tenner. And you've got to have a rucksack. And if you haven't got one, we'll sell you one for a tenner. And you've got to have waterproof trousers. And if you haven't got one, we'll sell you one for whatever. You know what I'm saying, a tenner, but it'd be whatever it is. You're quite right. I've actually seen that. Whereas you go to somewhere like nuclear races, it's nuclear races. If you want some of our merchandise, it's here, but you don't need to have it. Yeah, you just feel like that a little bit. He does. It always feels because I remember people buying the Rat Race season passes. Because you remember that used to be very trendy. That's mm-hmm. how a lot of us got into ultra runs. Uh, thankfully, when all my friends was doing it, I was struggling to do a ten k. Never mind a uh, yeah you know, the wall or something like that. And yeah, they probably spent just as much on the season pass on actually doing the events because you had to pay fees, you had to pay parking, you you had to pay like ten pound for a timing chip or something like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, it it was like a false economy. It was rain air economy. I, I get it. I, I, you're right. I look back. I never even thought about it like that because I was just always thought, yeah, they're selling extras, but yeah, it, they made it so you had to have money. And I saw that at Man V Mountain, someone had come and he'd got a a jacket that wasn't tapered se- seams. So they said to him he couldn't run. So we actually go to the shop, to, to the rat race shop, and buy one of their tapered seam jackets, which was no not the same quality as what he'd already got. I think he'd got an Innovate one, but it just wasn't tapered seam- seamed. It was more like a, a a windproof jacket rather than a the tapered seam waterproof jackets. Oh, they, they probably did a favour. If it rained, they'd have to cut him out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm sorry, Innovate. Uh, but also, I've never forgiven Rat Race for what they did to Hellrunner. Taking it on and doing, like you say, everything was cut. Hellrunner in Delamere Forest was one of the best races that existed, and then it got Rat Raced and then cancelled. Yeah, yeah. And and now they're going into this into these multi-million pound, well, multi-thousand pound adventure races where the the bucket list races are, is there a market for it? I don't know. I mean, that there's obviously something for them, but that's where they've yeah. moved to. I was thinking this, Alan, and they're not cheap. They look like fun, but if you were going to do something like that and you have the money to, surely you'd pay that little bit extra and do it with one of the other companies that exist because Rat Race were not innovators in that space, in the bucket list. You've been able to, you know, trek the Nile or, sorry, trek the Amazon or go down the, the Nile for years and years and years. And there's specialized travel agents that have existed for years who will not just sort you out um, the race, they'll sort you out flights as well. So I do think in hindsight, I think it was a misstep. Yeah, but, but they're getting the numbers. They don't need many numbers to be able to put it on you. And this is the thing, they only need... 10, 15 people for each one, and they're covering their overheads. And will they ever make money like they did at Dirty Weekend? I doubt it. But but there's probably much less risk involved with it as well. You know, if you look at Dirty Weekend, there's a lot of risk involved with Dirty Weekend. The amount of obstacles that they had to put in place, they're constantly trying to sell tickets, big risk. But are they? Because maybe it's just like you say, because there's 10 to 15 people on it, and maybe I don't hang out in the circles of people who are doing that. But I'm only aware of one person who's paid to go on those trips, and you interviewed him. Yeah, yeah, and, and right. And he, I mean, he actually said, I think he paid £3,000 for the, the ticket to go, and it was £3,000 worth of kit he had to buy. You know, it's, it's a £6,000 event. It would have been 2000, mm. it would have been 2000 he hadn't gone to Rat Race store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, no, and I do wonder, Violin, whether this is why they're bringing back the C2 Summit stuff because they've realized that it is slightly easier to get 100, 200 people paying 100 pounds than it is getting 10 to 15 paying 3,000. I think the C2 Summit, and I think they're going to be getting two to 3,000 paying 100 pounds. I, I really think that this is their C2 Summit is going to be. It, it could get it could get Rat Race back in the UK race scene because they got rid of them all. They got rid of everything. Everything was going, go, going, going, going. 
and then they've launched this, and I think whoever has idea for it was absolutely a stunning idea, you know. And people will still do the wall, and see some people will still do the coast to coast. But there's other events out there, Cockburn Ultra uh, events, which are the guys who did Escape from Meriden. They do some amazing ultra runs, you know, um, up and down the country, all over the place. None of them are as much as Rat Race, and they are potentially. I'm, I'm not going to say they're better put on, but but they're, they're no worse put on. You know what I mean? Better markings. You know what I mean? Some of them I've done. Um, and, and Well, it's, it's just different. You get that personal feel. I like a personal feel and you don't get it from Rat Race anymore. No, you don't. And I do wonder whether they're regretting Exis in the OCR scene when they did, because no, not, they wouldn't have a monopoly, but they would be one of a few touring companies. If they still did the... Oh, what, what was it you used Men's to be? Health. Called? Men's Health. Men's Health, yeah. If he still did them, so I wonder whether they regret that, and I wonder if they regret not waiting a couple of years and seeing this fitness racing thing come on. Because again, it wouldn't surprise me with the contacts they have within some of these stadiums, they could probably easily have put on um, something like that. Without a doubt, can you imagine doing men's health in Main Road? Exactly. Yeah, not men's health. High Rock style event in in Main Road. Sorry, that would be absolutely phenomenal, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it would be deeper than stuff that they're putting on. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, before we go in, I want to quickly touch on something that we talked about when we talked about Faiso joining um, Mr. Adamson being a turncoat and joining UIPM. And we discussed about this. We, we asked James and we said, like, what would happen in terms of if people didn't want to do it? And he was on about this voting, you get 30 people to sign up. Um, I've been approached this week about it myself because we 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 semi joked about doing it ourselves, but we're too busy doing other things here and we haven't got a chance to do it. So someone asked, "Would would I sign up?" Um, and I said, "Well, I'd need to know what you're going to put forward to James first, but potentially, or, or not to James, to the board of British Obstacle Sports. Um, I think we should have a I think we should have a say on what, whether we join Pentathlon GB or not." I want to know a lot more about it before someone else makes a decision for British Obstacle Sports. I would love to know more about it. I've still got faith in British Obstacle Sports to make the right decision, whatever it be, but I do think it should, we should know more and it should be open and up front. So um, the people who are behind it currently don't want their names mentioned. So they've asked if we would be a bit of a go-between here. So I have turned around and said, if you want to be signed this petition, so the 30 names, I think they've got, nearly 30 now anyway, but if you wanted to sign it, if you drop me a message at admin at ukocr.com and when the petition's out, I will forward it for you to sign. Um, so mm. I'm going to do that. So should we give a bit more clarity? If you missed the episode a couple of weeks ago, generally what we're going to ask for is to put forth this idea of giving all members a free vote on what happens next and whether effectively we carry on as ourselves and if we are then approved by um upim or sounds like a damn computer company but um but will pentathlon whether they decide that we're in charge of um obstacle and pentathlon in the uk i don't fancy our chances but yeah um whether or not you know, we go on our own and it's been up to Pentathlon, they can either say, yeah, you've got it or no, but it doesn't matter because we'll go on our own. Or if we say, cool, we'll team up with um, Pentathlon GB and we'll amalgamate. Is that basically what we're asking for a free vote on? Yes. From that, from understand, that is what we're asking. And when it all comes out, I'll know more. I'm just putting it out there at this moment in time that it will be more about, not about, whether we're joined or not at this moment in time, but whether there should be a vote to whether we're joined or not of its members. So it's a two two um, phase process. Unfortunately, guys, we talked about politics earlier. It's complicated sometimes, but what we need, what we would need, is enough people to vote for this motion to then allow us to have a vote in the future. Yes, and that is currently what it's going to be. So once once the petition's been done, I, I'm going to get a copy and I've said. I will pass it on to anyone who wants wants a vote on it. I'm going to try not to get involved in the politics of it. I just want to. I think we should have a vote. That's all. And I'll be open. And I've, and I've said that. I think we should all have a vote. We're all members. Um, yeah. Um, 
But some interesting facts has come out while I've been looking into this, Ian. How much money over the last, since 2021 to 2025, UI, not UIPM, Pentathlon GP have been awarded by the Sports Council. So, they've got, so this is what they've already had and some that's promised to them before to end of 2025. Is it the same amount that we pay to who's hot? <laughs> if we're paying £5 million to who's hot again, I want to know where we've got £5 million from. £5 million? Pounds. I think it was £5.6 million. Pound. Over a million pound a year they've been getting from Sport, from Sport England or Sport, British Sports Council. That's a lot of money. That is for a governing body which had, what, 2,000 members? Um. I think it's three thousand. I think it's three thousand members. I think I've seen somewhere two and a half to three thousand members. Um, wow, that's a lot we've, of money. We've got one thousand six hundred. Can we have half a million? Well, I, I guess that's the the key. Isn't it? If we did join Pentathlon GP, I'd like to know how much of that would be allocated to British obstacle sports. And this is the the rub. We, again, it's hard not to get into this. Too much. So I'll try and you can be out of style if I if I get on my high horse too much. But that that's the rob in terms of the potential conflicts of it's not conflicts of interest. It's a a conflict of where you allocate stuff. Conflict of priorities. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Because Pentathlon GB, their focus would be on getting the best pentathletes who, as part of their pen- pentathlon career, could do obstacles. So to me, that would be funding lots and lots of little 60-meter training facilities, which in and of themselves is great. Fantastic, we need more training facilities. But on the other hand, if this hadn't happened and BOSS stood alone, sorry, British Obstacles stood alone, and it got determined to be a sport, we could have had money which pays for free k courses could pay for technical officials because i don't think pentathlon they might want them but i'm not sure they care too much about a british obstacle technical official other than the ones that will be judging the 60 meter yes but i i got a, i got a bit of a pyramid sent to me um and it was explained a little bit about modern pentathlon and where the discipline sit and so we we're only interested in OCR, yeah. But straight up, I'll be straight up. I'm only interested in OCR. So at the top of this penta, uh, this pyramid, you have got all five disciplines, okay. And then underneath it, you've got um, the column tetrathlons. So that's four disciplines, not including obstacle course racing. And then they've got another one that does include obstacle course racing. So that's four. So you've got two more there. Then you've got the the tri parts. Two of them have got obstacle course racing. Two haven't. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So that's six sports now we've got. And then we've got duathlons, and we've got another four. So that's ten more sports <coughs> before we get down to the single sports. And then we've got obstacle course racing on its own. So we've got literally 15 sports under modern pentathlon. Okay, so we've got 15 sports under modern pentathlon. How many of those sports do not include obstacle? Um, one, two, three. So four include obstacle, five include obstacle course racing. So ten. Right. Okay. So, but but that, that's part. That's just part of it. That you know, that's just part of them. So you've got you've got it in the one of the four, two of the three, one of the doubles, yeah, and then the single one. So you, you've got it in one, but it's just I don't know. It just so should we get one third because we're in five out of ten, but then we've got to share it with some other people, or is it just one at one fifteenth? And if it's one fifteenth, it's not fair. And here's how the marriage doesn't quite work because again, the pentathlon obstacle is not Farmyard Ultra do 24 hours and 10 obstacles. It is not going doing nuclear um, races, um, doing a, a 10K course with a death slide. Yeah, a, a pentathlete is not going down death slide. And Ian Adamson might if he gets close enough to it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And it's, I, I, there's a lot to be decided. There's a lot more to come out behind it, but I think we all need the facts before there's any voting done. Uh, it'd be great that we all knew the facts. So all those members who are paying our fee to British Obstacle Sports and, and being a member and supporting them and everything else, and it all came back to us rather than be at a board level. And some things I need to be at a board level, I get that. 
Um, and like I say, I, I trust British Obstacle Sports that they will do the right thing. But I do think that this one needs to be a vote. Um, and then maybe we have a vote on whether we have um, Ian and Allen's World Obstacle as the governing body for the world. Yeah, World Obstacle Ninja saw one. It has now been going, listener, as you're listening to this, two weeks. And in those two weeks, we've actually accomplished more than Ian Adamson because thus far, we have helped Ninja do an award show. We have um, done media at a couple of events, albeit they were fitness racing, but there were still a couple of events. So we've done that. We've also organised our own award show, Alan, and we've set up a website. So I think in terms of time that one has existed compared to achievements, we're ahead. We're ahead. <laughs> oh, I like it, Ian. I like it. Um, just quickly touch on that. Now now FISO has joined UIPM. I guess the next stage is for European obstacle racing, whatever it is, or looks after European, would be the next stage for them to join European Penta. Oh, gosh. Before it starts coming down to us, lots of lots to talk about. The close season could be very busy for us here. The close season could be very busy for us. Could be incredibly busy, but it's not the close season when it comes to fitness racing, Alan. And we actually have three events going on this weekend. No way. What what we got, what we got this weekend? So, firstly, over in uh, in Ireland, we have, I believe it is BUA. Let me just double check that that's the correct. I hate acronyms because I always get them wrong. But yeah, BUA Fitness Race put on by our good friend Seamus of um, of, of the in North West Island. So not Northern Ireland, North West Island up, up there. I think all that's up there is Seamus and the BMS Warehouse Gym. I think that's all that exists in there. But no they're hotels, putting on a race. No. <laughs> no other sign of life, but we're putting on the BUA race. Uh, our good friends Tom and Dino will be there supporting it. So anything we hear about that, we'll let you know. This Friday, so as you're listening to this as a non-Patreon member today, Neil Marsh Fitness is putting on a deck of strong. And Alan, get this, it's sold out on a Friday. Oh, wow. And Wow. A Friday this, sold out? A Friday. I think it's only after work, so it's 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. Deck of Strong happening. And do you want to know what else makes it remarkable? Go on. They barely did any advertising for it. So, but they are a Decker affiliated gym, so people saw it um, and were like, oh, it's Decker, I'm going. Exactly. I, I do think Decker is going to be big in 2024 in the UK. You heard it here first, folks. Actually, no, you've probably heard it somewhere else first. You heard it here seventh, maybe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> or eight, but yeah, keep an eye out. Uh, and if you see a Decker event come live, you better get in quick because they're selling out. Um, finally, this coming weekend is Affex over in Birmingham. I'm going to be there at some point, probably on Sunday. Our good friend Mike Nolan's going to be there with Matt B. Davis, of all people. So if you've ever wanted to meet Matt B. Davis, head over to Birmingham and you get to meet him. So Matt's flying over. Matt is flying over, as we're recording this, he is over the South Pole, I believe. He's trying to prove that the Earth isn't flat. He's taking the scenic route. And providing he doesn't get eaten by the ice monsters, he'll be probably landing um, just about when this goes out to Patreons. Oh, awesome. Welcome to England again, Matt. Is he just coming over Welcome. for Affects or is he coming over something else? I think he's just coming over for Affects. Um not completely sure on his itinerary this time. It was a little bit of a... It wasn't last minute, but it kind of was for an international trip. I think he had like a month or two's notice. So, yeah, um, say he'll be in Birmingham. And I think he's actually competing in Apex with Mike Nolan. So that'll be another time for me and you to beat. Oh, love it. Love it. Another, don't forget, they've got to get the chips right this time then because, the, you know, none of this... Well, I chips. had an I had an update on that actually, Alan. Yeah. It wasn't a chip malfunction. What was it? It was a one hour time penalty for wearing a Christmas jersey outside of December. 
I actually saw the pictures of that tonight, and I loved him. His Christmas journey, Will and his Christmas journey. I was going, oh, I had to say something to him. So I, I'm sorry, those are the rules. If you check the rule book, although it might have been updated recently to remove it, there's a one hour time penalty for wearing Christmas related stuff in November. Can't help it. Um, sorry, guys. I love it. I love it. Um, who's off back this week as well? I thought they'd gone, but they're, apparently they're coming back on Monday. So they, they're back. What are they doing? What are they actually reviewing or previewing? I think that I think they're actually going to get, they've got Feddy. And Dan on, I'm hoping they're open to having them on. I hope they have got them on because I've now let it go. And they're going to review the season so far. Well, the season total, I guess, as well. Yeah, so sorry. Far. Not so far. The season, the season so far for last year. But I'm thinking more of the season so far for next year because we've now got six events because we announced Rude Rampage are coming back on, I want to say July this. Oh, I don't know. I, I can't remember the date. July sometime. Yeah. Yeah, I've got 16th or 18th, I don't know it, yeah. July, it's on our Facebook page and on our website. I'm not logging on. <laughs> so it's either July unless it's June. Yeah, no, it's definitely July. Definitely July, I know it is. Okay. 100% July. So, so, they are the, so they are the next week then, yeah? Yes. So we've just got to find August and September and finalise the deal with August and September and then we will have our full season um, for 2024. It's July the 14th. They are advertising now. And you know what I like about this photo they're using to advertise? Yeah. I don't know a single person on that photo, which means <laughs> that they've reached people outside of the immediate OCR family. And I love that. Oh. Um, I've got a discount code. So if you enter between now and 12 a.m. on Friday, so if you're a patron and you listen to this now, yeah, Listen to it now. And if you enter between now and Friday at lunchtime, so if you get on early and use Rude Rampage 23 Champ, all one word, you'll get five pounds off the early bird price. There we go. Perfect. And if you, you've missed that, then you should be a Patreon, I guess. Yeah, that we've saved you money, haven't you? You've saved you money this month already. Perfect. How how awesome are we? <laughs> We're amazing. Ian, who you got on your podcast this coming week? Do you know? Hopefully, I've not recorded it yet, but hopefully we're going to have uh, Tor back, um, Life of Tor, um, talking about her uh, High Rocks London experience. It is a return podcast. If you remember, she is living with cancer. She's yeah. not got long less left, and she set um, doing High Rocks London as something for her to you know, achieve, and she's raised a hell of a lot of money doing it. So I really can't wait to talk to her. And I'll say, no, it's a good episode. I've, I've not recorded it yet, but it's a good episode. The last one was good. Yeah, she she's such a good um, person to, to have on. I'm going to try and get her husband on as well, if he'll if he'll come on and we'll, we'll chat with him as well. Perfect, Tim. Liking it. I'm liking it. Right, and I guess, Alan, on that, I should say it's a goodbye from me. And listeners, once again, thank you for listening. Don't forget to hit the like button. Join the Patreon. You never know when you're going to get an offer. And we'll speak to you all soon. Bye.